I grew up uh, in Granite Falls. I graduated from high school in 41 and stayed here. And, <clears throat> and then during the war, I went off to war. But before that, I was played baseball for the town team for a long time and really enjoyed it. Made a lot of good, really good, good friends. Well, I tell you, I wanted, I wanted to fly. And, and that was a chance to, if I passed all the stuff from the test to get in, then I, I, I was going, to, going off to cadet school. So I, and I wanted to fly. If a young man wanted to fly, the United States of America in 1942 was a place and a time like none other in history. On December 7, 1941, an aerial attack drew the country into the biggest, deadliest war in human history. A war that would ultimately be decided by air power. An immediate need for tens of thousands of American pilots was created, and the absolute necessity of winning the war fostered a national effort to design and build flying machines that had only been dreamed about before. And we built them by the thousands. As a result, the flying careers of Robert Bernard Dalton of Edina, Minnesota, and thousands of others like him were nothing less than amazing. In just a little over 250 hours of flight time, spread over about 29 weeks, they received the best flight training on the planet at the time. In the case of fighter pilots like Robert, they had the opportunity to fly virtually every state-of-the-art pursuit plane in the Army Air Corps inventory. For one thing, the U.S. was the only warring power with enough fuel to provide such broad-based training for so many pilots. I was going to Gustavus uh, in 1941, the fall of 41, and then the, I joined the old Army Air Corps Reserve Program to see if I could finish out a, a year at Gustavus, and I finished my freshman year. And then the, my, sec, my sophomore year, the, I was called up to go to cadets, aviation cadets. Gustavus Adolphus College was founded in 1862 by Swedish Americans and is affiliated with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I was, what was I, I was 18 when I, when I joined at, at Gustavus and then and went up the years to 19 and 20, right up the ladder. In 1939, there were only 55 enlisted pilots in the then U.S. Army Air Corps. On the 3rd of June, 1941, Public Law 99 was enacted, which allowed enlisted men to apply for flight training. Candidates had to be between the ages of 18 and 22, have a high school diploma with at least one and a half credit hours worth of math, and have graduated in the top half of their class. In November, 1941, this was reduced to being at least 18 years old and possessing a high school diploma. The huge need for pilots meant that the training program had to be streamlined as well. The amazing end result of modifying both the requirements and the training was that 193,000 new pilots entered the Army Air Forces during World War II. Even for a Minnesota kid, the winter of 1942 was bitter in St. Louis. I went down to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis 
and uh, it was the winter time of 42 and it was cold, cold, cold. Matter of fact, the area that we lived in down there it was called Pneumonia Gulch. And for a good reason, I mean, it was very, very cold. After that, going off to uh, cadets, we went into Washington University, which is in St. Louis by itself. It's in Clayton, the suburb of uh, St. Louis. For three months, I think we were there for about three months and it was all math. It was all strictly mathematics and things like that, navigational aids and things. So it was, it was a beautiful campus and it was a very, very nice place to, to spend the early spring of that year. At St. Louis, it was kind of funny. At Washington University on Saturday, it was parade day. So we had uh, 500 cadets there and we'd have a parade and cars would stop on the highway and we had an audience that wouldn't quit because we were all in khaki, khaki uniforms and all marching, all young, all 18, 19 years old. They'd come every week just to see us parade. I think it was Lambert Field in uh, St. Louis and just got into a, a Piper Cub or something like just to see if we, if we liked it. Some of the people decided at that time that maybe flying wasn't for them. They, they didn't want to get their feet off the ground. So they, a couple of them uh, just quit uh, the cadet program at that time. Training in the cadet program came in four stages. Classification lasted one week. The subsequent education and training stages were nine weeks each. The classification stage processed the cadet and issued him his equipment. This was the stage where it would be decided whether the cadet would train as a navigator, bombardier, or pilot. Candidates who failed the testing or the advanced physical were returned to the regular army. I went to primary down at Tucson, Arizona to Ryan Field and we flew the Ryan. That was the home of the Ryan. And so we, we flew the Ryan in primary flying school for I think probably two and a half, three months. Primary pilot training taught basic flight using two-seater training aircraft. This was often done by contract schools, civilian pilot training schools, through the Civil Aeronautics Authority War Training Service. Cadets received 60 to 65 flight hours in Ryan PT-22s, Fairchild PT-19s, or Stearman's. Primary was, was fine. It was just getting us, just like the word primary, we're getting used to the aircraft and to see if we really liked what we're doing. I remember my first cross-country trip in you know, Ryan. I took off, I had an instructor for one trip. And then he said, okay, you're on your own. So he got out and I strapped up the parachute that he was in and then we, off I went. And then after a while, well, I got up to about 2,500 feet. I was over Ryan Field and I could see my destination. <laughs> and that was my first cross country. <laughs> so I went down to the destination, turned around, came back, all alone for about 20, 25 miles. The basic phase of pilot training taught the cadets to fly in formation, fly by instruments, or by aerial navigation, to fly at night, and fly for long distances. Each space got bigger, more advanced. Uh, the classroom work was more difficult, and uh, it was kind of kind of hard. We, we had full days. We had a lot of full days. 
And then we went off to Lemoore, California for basic, where we flew the VT-13. Lemoore Army Airfield was located nine miles southwest of Lemoore, California. The base was built during World War II as an Army Air Force's training field. The Valti BT-13 Valiant was an advanced trainer aircraft built by Valti Aircraft for the United States Army Air Corps. The BT-13 had a more powerful engine and was faster and heavier than the primary trainer. It required the student pilot to use two-way radio communications with the ground and to operate landing flaps and a two-position Hamilton Standard Controllable Pitch Propeller. The flaps were operated by a crank and cable system. Its pilots nicknamed it the Vaulty Vibrator. The BT-13 was introduced into the Army training program in 1940. 9,525 of them were built. After that, I went back to Phoenix, to Luke Field, where we flew the AT-6, Navy had it as the SNJ, and uh, we flew that, and I got, while I was still a cadet, I got 20, 20 hours and something like that in a P-40. There were about six of us that uh, were allowed to check out in the P-40. Advanced pilot training placed the graduates in one of two categories, single-engined or multi-engined. Single-engine pilots flew the AT-6 advanced trainer. Multi-engine pilots learned to fly the AT-9, the AT-10, the AT-11, or the AT-17 advanced trainers. And at that time, we had to make a decision uh, of whether we wanted to go into multi-engine or single engine. And my, I was pretty, pretty fortunate. I was a, uh, a cadet captain at the time, and my roommate was the cadet colonel. So he and I got together and we got all of our friends that wanted to go to fighter school to join us going to fighter school. So. But we had, a, we had a kind of an in it that way. The T-6s that Robert Dalton and the other cadets flew in advanced training at Luke Field were the classrooms for most of the Allied pilots who flew in World War II. Called the SNJ by the Navy and the Harvard by the British Royal Air Force, the advanced trainer AT-6 was designed as a transition trainer between basic trainers and first-line tactical aircraft. It was redesignated T-6 in 1948. In all, the T-6 trained several hundred thousand pilots in 34 countries over a period of 25 years. A total of 15,495 of the planes were built. The Curtis P-40 Warhawk was an American single-engine, single-seat, all-metal fighter and ground attack aircraft that first flew in 1938. The Warhawk was used by most Allied powers during World War II and remained in frontline service until the end of the war. It was the third most produced American fighter after the P-51 and the P-47. By November 1944, when production of the P-40 ceased, 13,738 had been built. That was a lot of fun. That was um, 650 horsepower, and it was a two-seater, one in front, one in back. And I had a very good instructor and he took me for a couple of rides, and, and then I, I started out in the back seat for about <laughs> one or two rides, and then I got in the front. But he was still flying it from the back. Mm -hmm. 
And it was, I was kind of following him with the rudder pedals with my feet. And he said, not so heavy on the feet, keep them off the rudder pedals. And the stick, I was calling him follow me because he wanted me to. And it was down at Phoenix. You know, the wrong thing about that, in the afternoon in Phoenix, it gets hot. And those heat thermals would toss us around. And we, while we were there, we went down to Gila Bend, which is halfway between Tucson and Phoenix for gunnery school. And that was our first opportunity to fire the guns from the, uh, in, from the wing. I graduated in 44E, which is May. And uh, we were supposed to have a month leave before we'd get orders to go somewhere. But that was cut short to two weeks. During World War II, Luke was the largest fighter training base in the Army Air Forces. Graduating more than 17,000 fighter pilots from advanced and operational courses in the AT-6, the P-40, P-51, and P-38. By February 7, 1944, pilots at Luke had achieved one million hours of flying time. I got orders to go to Moses Lake, Washington, which is, it was 12,000 foot runways with a 500 foot cement overrun at, at each end. So I, we checked out in the P-39, that was my first tricycle landing aircraft that I flew. And it was, uh, it was great for us, but the only wrong thing about the, the 39 is that you can get into what they call a flat spin. The P-39 Era Cobra, designed and built by Bell Aircraft, was already part of America's air arsenal when the war began. The design was innovative, and the airplane remains controversial, despite its outstanding war record. In a September 2017 article on the warriorscout.com website titled, America's Worst World War II Fighter Was the Star of the Russian Air Force, Sebastian Roblin wrote, quote, The P-39 era Cobra may be the least loved American fighter plane of World War II, deemed inadequate by military planners at the outset and written off as nearly useless by many historians. Certainly the P-39 could not match the high altitude performance of classic American warbirds such as the P-51 Mustang nor the hard-hitting P-47 Thunderbolt. And yet it was pilots of the Era Cobra, not the Thunderbolt or Mustang, that achieved the highest scores of any aviators flying an American warplane during World War II. This fact is not better known because those Era Cobra pilots flew with red Soviet stars on their wings. Unlike the high altitude air battles of the strategic bombing campaigns in Western Europe, the majority of air operations over the Eastern Front occurred at low altitude in support of troops on the ground, a domain in which the P-39's deficiencies barely mattered. Furthermore, Soviet airfields were generally close to the front lines, rendering the Era Cobra's short range irrelevant. Nearly 5,000 P-39s were delivered into Soviet service. Five of the Soviet Union's top ten fighter aces flew P-39s. After the 39s, then we got P-38, L model, brand new from, from Lockheed. The iconic twin-tail Lockheed P-38 Lightning was simply the most innovative airplane of its day. First conceived in 1937 by Lockheed Chief Engineer Hall L. Hibbard and his then assistant Clarence Kelly Johnson, the twin-boomed P-38 combined speed with unheard of advances two supercharged engines and a potent mix of 450 caliber machine guns and a 20 millimeter cannon. The P-38 was capable of climbing to 3,300 feet in a single minute and reaching 400 miles per hour, 100 miles per hour faster than any fighter in the world. It also doubled as an intimidating long range threat capable of carrying a larger payload than early B-17s 
and boasting a range of 1,150 miles. My first fight, first one or two fights, but the first one at least, I was in the jump seat behind the pilot. We got in the airplane, we middle of the runway, nose was down the yellow strip, and he turned around after he gave it the throttle, two, th two throttles like in, in between fingers like this, and yeah, he pushed the saddles up, and anyhow, then he turned around and he, he looked at me. And I thought, well, hey, we're, we're going that way. Why aren't you looking that way? But he turned around, looked at me, and he said, Bob, how fast are we going? And I said, about 110. He said, okay, and he pulled the wheel back. He's still looking at me, because he knew with those counter-rotating props, there's no torque. On a single engine, you have torque where they will pull you off the runway if you haven't got rudder control. But anyhow, we just pulled it right straight up. We went right straight up in the air. And then uh, that was my first ride yeah, in, the, in the 38. It was just a wonderful experience. We went down to uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, before that from Moses Lake, and checked out the P-47 Thunderbolt. And that thing, you, know, you could go through a forest and it wouldn't hurt the airplane. It was a real solid piece. And one thing I liked about the 47, it had a radial engine, a round engine instead of an inline engine, which the uh, 38 did. Uh, and it was probably, in that respect, a real, more reliable airplane. The Republic P-47 Thunderbolt was another incredible technological story written by the U.S. aviation industry during World War II. The Jug, short for Juggernaut, was practically a flying tank. The P-47 was big. It was three feet wider, four feet longer, and 50% heavier than the P-51 Mustang. It was nearly twice the weight of the British Spitfire. It was fast. Despite its mass and weight, its 18-cylinder 2,600 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R28 double wasp engine, the same power plant used by the Vought Corsair and the Grumman Hellcat, enabled the Jug to keep pace with the Mustang. Both had a top speed of around 440 miles per hour. But while the P-47 could reach altitudes in excess of 40,000 feet, its range of just over 800 miles gave it only half the legs of the P-51. And it was deadly. With four 50 caliber machine guns mounted in each wing, the Thunderbolt could shred both enemy warplanes and ground targets alike. Its internal stores were capable of holding 3,400 rounds, which enabled it to fire non-stop for 30 seconds. The Jug was at its best when diving on enemy airplanes with all guns blazing. It was capable of carrying as much as 3,000 pounds of external ordnance. I was in the um, 508th Fighter Group, 468th Fighter Squadron, and there were three squadrons in our flight. And uh, we had a, I tell you, the, the camaraderie was just excellent, just great. And like I said before, the mechanics were still great. They hadn't changed a bit, they kept it, they got better. The 508th Fighter Group was constituted on 5 October 1944 and activated on 12 October. It trained with P-47s to provide very long range escort for bombardment units. It was moved to Hawaii in January 1945 and served as part of the defense force for the islands. It also trained replacement pilots for other organizations, repaired P-47s and P-51s received from combat units, and ferried aircraft to forward areas. The 468th Fighter Squadron was formed in late 1944 under 2nd Air Force as one of the last P-47 Thunderbolt Fighter Squadrons programmed for deployment to the Western Pacific Theater. It arrived in Hawaii in early 1945, assigned to 7th Air Force. Like 
Lack of a serious fighter defense over Japan at high altitudes and reprogramming of B-29 raids over Japan to night low-level fast attacks led to the 468th reassignment as a replacement training unit based in Hawaii. It also performed air defense of the islands until inactivation in November of 1945. Right after we got to Oahu, we were stationed at Hickam Field, and I can see, I can still in my mind see the uh, bullet holes and the, the, that were in the, in the hangars, the doors of the hangars and the cement, how it was chipped away because of the bullet holes. And I thought at the time that I'm here for a for a purpose, we flew a lot of uh, patrolling between the Aleutians, where, where here's Hawaii, the Aleutians were here, Midway and Wake, Guam, Marianas were down, we're here, and we would be, we'd be going just, just about uh, halfway to all of those places, just about two, three times a week. And the flights alternate, one like our squadron rather would would, would divide up into four different areas. And our flight would go this way, another flight would go that way, and then we'd kind of converge and come back in. But most of the time, at night, we were back at Bellows Field in Hawaii. But the main thing is that uh, it was, you're all alone out there. You're depending on the United States government to give you a good quality piece of machinery, and and it'll bring you back home. We, got, we were flying P-47s, and then one day, uh, one of the guys in my flight, uh, right outside of Hickam Field, about 15, 20 miles away towards the mountains, the mountains were going up like this, there was a peak here, and it went down like this, and in between them, there was a road called the Pali Pass. But one of the guys in our flight was kind of going through with a flight, flight of four, we're going through the Pali Pass. We got through, and number four wasn't there. He hit the mountain and got killed at Oahu. So you don't have to be on, uh, in the middle of a war zone to, to get killed or to get hurt. And I, I can remember his mother and dad lived in Sioux City, Iowa. And they would come out, and they, they, they couldn't find the airplane. It was in the forest somewhere on one of those mountains. They could not find the airplane for years and years. And his mother and dad would come out, take their summer vacation, come out to Hawaii, and look for the airplane. Finally, after, oh, many, many years, probably 20, they finally found the aircraft. That, that really struck home. When we think of the price paid for victory in any war, we tend to think first of the souls lost in combat. But the fact is, the price paid is far, far greater than that. In the case of America's flying services, the process of leaping from a standing start to form the greatest air power force in human history in just four years required more than genius, commitment, and resources. It took thousands of courageous people willing to face the serious risks inherent in becoming combat air crew, no matter what the ultimate assignment might be. In the continental United States, between 1942 and August of 1945, there were 824 P-51 accidents resulting in 137 fatalities and 358 wrecked aircraft. The P-47 was much worse, with 3,049 accidents, with 455 fatalities, and a staggering 1,125 airplanes wrecked. Totaling all Army Air Force's accidents in the United States from December 41 to August 1945, there were 52,651 accidents, 6,039 of them fatal, resulting in 14,903 deaths, and 13,873 aircraft destroyed. These losses, too, must be added to the necessary, yet terrible cost of victory. These losses, too, were the selfless sacrifices of the willing, the last full measure of thousands of young heroes.
when I walked down Hennepin Avenue to, from Gustavus to Dolphus College, when I walked down Hennepin Avenue to get on a train to go to Je Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, we were having a great time. We were all very happy that we were going to be doing something for our country. And uh, that, it still shows what today, I still think the same. I think if I, if I had to do it over again, I'd do it without any hesitation at all.